All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of mind basics. One of the things we used to say to describe our teaching is that the science of mind was a faith, it was a philosophy, and it was also a way of life. So we are a faith, a philosophy, a way of life. I don't know that we actually still use that slogan anymore, but I like it, so I use it. Um, how did I get to the science of mind personally? Well, you know, like many of us, I was at, uh, when we find something that uh, we really need, I was at a particularly low point in my life. I mean, really low. I was laying on the shag green carpet Looking down, thinking, how had this become my life? Shag green carpet. You know the carpet I'm talking about. It was kind of a lemon-lime color. Everybody had it in the 70s. The problem was, this was the 80s, and uh, uh, it was a low point. And so I remember praying, God, show me. I don't care what it is, just show me a better way, and I will do it. And what was shown to me was the science of mind. And how that happened was... Um, like most people, I was in a bar one Sunday morning. And, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I was working, I was working. And, uh, and Terry Cole Whitaker, do you all remember Terry Cole Whitaker? So she came on TV and she said these principles like I had never heard anybody articulate them. First of all, I'd never heard the principles. And second of all, nobody articulated them quite like her. And I thought, I got to know more about that. I've got to find out what this is. So I, you know, had... I started my journey. It was like, you know, I had prayed, God, show me. I don't care what it is, because I cannot keep my face in the shag carpet here. I have got to lift up. There's got to be something better. And I saw Terry on TV. And so then I started to attend religious science churches, and I went to class with Dr. Bitzer's church and Dr. Hornaday downtown, and then Frank Richelieu in Redondo Beach, because these were all the very successful ministers at that time. And I became a volunteer for the World Ministry of Prayer, uh, and I worked at the home office for our denomination. Uh, and then I went to work for the Huntington Beach Church, which at the time was one of our bigger churches. And then I took my first job as a minister in San Jose for about two years. And when I was done in San Jose, I got a call from this church saying, would you be interested in coming to North Hollywood? I thought, North Hollywood? I'm not even sure where North Hollywood is. <laughs> And I had lived in Los Angeles for years. But you know, that hill is so high. <laughs> to come over the hill was an epic adventure back then, or so we thought. You know, I thought at the bottom of Laurel Canyon, they checked your visa. Um, so I came here and, um, a, a, a while ago. And now what I want to share with you is that this teaching, the science of mind teaching, is a path of personal transformation a path of spiritual growth, a path of healing, if you, in fact, actually practice it. Now, if you don't practice it and you just come to church on Sunday, that's also fine. But I don't want you to tell me that science of mind doesn't work. Because when we sit down and really talk about it, and I start to say, so tell me, do you have a daily spiritual practice? Do you meditate every day? Do you affirm? Do you pray in the affirmative? Right? Do you have an ongoing relationship with the presence? And people say, well, you know, I'm really busy, and I come to church when I can, and I try to think positive. And it's like, okay, you have not been practicing the science of mind for 40 years, as you like to tell me. You have been kind of sitting at the edge of the pool. Now, sitting at the edge of the pool is very different than learning how to swim, isn't it? It's very different. You know, you can sit on the edge of the pool and read books about swimming. You can look at catalogs with pretty bathing suits. You can watch other people swim. But it's not you swimming, is it? And it's the same with the practice of the science of mind. When you're praying in the affirmative every day, when you're using affirmations, when you have an ongoing practice of meditation, and you're studying the work, then I would say, you're in the pool. You're in the pool. And you might even be tiptoeing toward the deeper end. But you're in the pool. Science of mind. Isn't that an interesting name? So science we mean, means the way something works. That's what Ernest Holmes was talking about when he called this the science of mind. 
Science means the way something works. Mind means God. So science of mind is the way God works in our world. Right? So I have something from the textbook that I really, really like. In our textbook, he said, science of mind is the culmination of revelations. Right? So he didn't invent this. He felt that great things had been revealed in different teachings around the world at different times, and he just sort of pulled the thread of the best of what he thought was the best of everything. Twisted it together and said, okay, that's where this comes from. So sometimes people come here and they say, oh, you know, there are things about your church that are very Eastern in its orientation. There are things that are very Buddhist. There are things that are very Hindu. There are things that are kind of Christian. There are things that are like Kabbalah and Judaism. There are things like, and you know, that's exactly what Ernest did, is that he studied all these different things. He felt there were common spiritual themes or spiritual deno uh, common denominators between different things. And that's what he pulled together, these threads, turned them into a rope, and that became the science of mind teaching. So science of mind is a culmination of revelations. We take the good wherever we find it. Isn't that a good idea? Take the good wherever you find it. If it's good, if it works for you, if it makes your life better, if it adds to you, absolutely. Why wouldn't we embrace that? And if it doesn't, then why would you subscribe to it? Right? She says, we take the good wherever we find it, making it our own insofar as we understand it. The realization that good is universal and that as much good as any individual is able to incorporate in his life is his to use is what constitutes the science of mind and spirit. See, that was the original name of the teaching. He called it the science of mind and spirit because he didn't want you to think it was just an intellectual thing. It also involved the spirit that you are, the spirit of God within you. And so... Is it a religion? People always ask, well, this isn't really a religion. And I go, yeah, it is. It is. We do the whole cycle with people. We bless them when they come in, and we bless them when they go out, and everything in between. We're, we do all those churchy things. <laughs> but some of those churchy things we hold in a somewhat different light. Now, this is important because we are not interested in making the way other people see things wrong. Remember, Ernest Holmes said, I want to be for something and against nothing. We believe that there are many paths up the mountain. The important thing is that you find a path and stay on the path. Right? And if you do, it will take you up the mountain. Your consciousness will grow. Your spirituality will really, really deepen. We are a denomination. You'll say, well, you're not really a church. Yes, we are a church. In fact, we are a denomination. Someone said to me recently, well, we're non-denominational. I said, no, we're not. We're not non-denominational. We are a denomination. Really, we are. 501c3. You get a tax credit for this. <laughs> yeah. We are a denomination. Ernest Holmes intentionally created this. It didn't just happen. Right? We have over 400 spiritual communities in over 30 countries around the world. They are... Um, communities like this, churches, there are teaching chapters, there are study groups and other types of ministries. And what we teach here is we teach a new thought philosophy, right, that brings religion and science together and offers spiritual tools for people to transform their lives and help make the world a better place. Now, let me tell you something that Ernest said that I have loved. He says there's no transformation without ongoing prayer and meditation. No transformation, right? So when you have an ongoing practice of prayer and meditation, you're in the pool. When you're thinking about it, you're dangling. Do you know what I mean? You see those people who just dangle, maybe a foot, perhaps a toe in the water. Oh, I'm just testing the water. I'll come for about five or ten years and see how I like it. If I can't come up with a reason to leave, if they don't really piss me off, well, then I guess I could stay. We teach a new thought philosophy, right, that brings ideas from religion and ideas from science together. And we have our own set of spiritual tools that will really transform your life if you will work with them on an ongoing basis. And so we do this, this transformation of our lives through the practice of the science of mind and spirit, which is also known as religious science. Now, Ernest had three big influences, I believe. He's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He got the philosophical component of our teaching. From a man named Thomas Troward, he got 
the idea of spiritual law that we talk about so much. And from Emma Curtis Hopkins, he got the mysticism. Right? So for us in the science of mind, some of what we teach, some of what we believe is that all of life is sacred. There is no life that is more sacred than your life. All of life is sacred. All, all, black, white, gay, straight, tall, short, da, da. You can fill in with all what you think of as the polarities. All of God's life is sacred. Now, this is important to understand. God does not love you because of what you are. You are because God loved you to begin with. That's the only reason you exist is because you are already loved by God. God doesn't say, well, I'd really love you a little more if you would just change your gender, blah, blah. Yeah, no, no, not at all. We have made that kind of nonsense up. We really have. God loves you for who you are as you are right now. And we have to balance that with the fact that we are on a path of personal growth and self-development and spiritual transformation where we're always trying to be more and be better but at the same time, you must know, you must know that God loves you right now for who you are as you are. God's not going to love you better when you change, is what I'm trying to say. Now, we do all of this. Remembering always that there is this law in operation that's important for us, and it's a law of cause and effect. And basically, what this means is it's done unto you as you believe, right? In essence, our thinking and our expectations really are what's creating our reality. Our teachings incorporate the ancient wisdom of spiritual traditions throughout the ages. You know, I, the more I study, the more I realized Ernest Holmes studied everything. He read and studied everything. He knew about all kinds of stuff, and a lot of it wound up in the science of mind. I think we help people experience a personal relationship with their creator. And I realize that's different for everybody. But Ernest Holmes founded this movement, you know, that, that is our denomination, the Church of Religious Science, which is now called Centers for Spiritual Living. We underwent a little identity thing a few years back, and we changed our name. So we are the Church of Religious Science. We are the North Hollywood Church of Religious Science, but our denomination is now called the Center for Spiritual Living. Uh, Ernest Holmes, interestingly enough, was born in 1887 on a small farm in Maine. He was the youngest of nine boys. Can you imagine? I think his mother must have been a saint. <laughs> nine boys. I cannot imagine. It's unbelievable to me. Uh, and so when he was a young guy, when he was a teenager, they said that he was always, always asking, who is God, who am I, and why am I here? Who is God? Who am I? And why am I here? And this questioning led to his, um, his book, which became our textbook, The Science of Mind, which was first published in 1926. So again, remember that science of mind uh, also referred to as religious science. You know, so he uses those interchangeably. We teach that there is a unity, a oneness in all life, that all life is actually connected and again, all life has value. And that intentions and ideas flow through a field of consciousness which affects and creates the world around us. You know, so in Science of Mind, we believe that the secret to living a successful life it to, is, uh, there are a number of components to this, but it certainly includes to choose positive and productive thoughts. You know, as you think, so you become to have this daily spiritual practice of prayer and meditation and affirmation, studying, service, tithing, all of these things. You know, and then on top of that, journaling and gratitude and forgiveness. This is maintenance. This is daily, daily stuff. You know, so religious science, I want you to know, is the name of the church that Ernest Holmes founded, which was the precursor to Centers for Spiritual Living. In Science of Mind, we believe the fields of religion, and the field of science are complementary. And that science will prove what the mystics have said for thousands of years about the nature of God, human beings, and the universe. And so these beliefs are being proven even now by many quantum physicists 
who have found that the universe is made up of energy that cannot be destroyed, and it is infinitely intelligent. So science of mind uses the laws of nature to prove spiritual principles. So what's the easy way to say this? When somebody says, what do they teach at that church you go to? Okay. <laughs> it's, no, it's pretty simple, really. We say, oh, what we believe is that God is all there is. That means God is in and through all people, animals, things. It's all God. Elsewhere in Ernest's writings, he says, the manifest universe is the body of God. So you wonder what the body of God looks like? Look around. Look at who's sitting in your seat. That's what the body of God looks like. The second thing is that your thought is the most powerful thing you have to work with to heal and grow and evolve your life. Hmm? Your thought can take you down or it can take you up. And you get to decide. And the third piece, all right, so God is all there is. Your thought's the most powerful thing you have to work with. And the third thing we would say is that love is a better way to be. We've tried not love in the world. It doesn't usually work out very well, does it? Think of all the times we've tried not love. Hmm? All the times we get real justified and, well, you know, but in this case, we just say that love is a better way to be. Now, let me help anybody who's new. We are in no way related to Scientology. Hmm? I, don't know, I don't know anything about Scientology, just that we are not that. Okay, so um, we are unique and a separate entity from Christian science, which we also think is a wonderful, wonderful teaching. Uh, Ernest, Ernest never attended Christian science, but when he was a young man, he did attend the Leland Powers School of Expression in Boston, and uh, students there, as well as some of the teachers, were involved in Christian science, and so he heard about it, read about it, and witnessed that they were having healings, which really intrigued him. Healing comes in many forms. You know, good is expressed through doctors, as well as medicine, as well as prayer. And so we believe in both prayer and modern medicine. We would never tell you here, oh, don't take those pills. That's not our job. Not our job at all. Now, are we a cult? Yeah, yeah. I hear that word pretty frequently. In a word, no. No, we're not. In religious science, we teach that each individual has influence over and responsibility for his or her own life. There you have it, right? We support personal responsibility. We encourage you to think for yourself and believe what feels true for you. Believe what actually you have tried and it makes a difference in your life. Now, we honor all paths to God. I believe we do that. But we teach religious science. We honor all forms of prayer. But we teach a particular way, form, technique of meditation, as well as affirmative prayer, which was one of Ernest Holmes' contributions to the body of New Thought work. He called his prayer spiritual mind treatment or treatment and it's a five-step process that harnesses the creative processes of consciousness. And so that's kind of something about what we're about. Um, got any questions? <laughs> okay, then we're going to do a little inner work. And so maybe, Sam, maybe you'll play a little, you'd give me the, the, the divine noodling for me. And uh, so I'm going to invite you all to sit up tall and close your eyes. And these are the words of Ernest Holmes. So your subconscious is a medium between life and what you're ex you experience. And your subconscious is a silent force within you which holds up images of thought to the universal law of mind, which in its turn reflects into your experience the things you inwardly believe. And so it is certain that you cannot believe in abundance while identifying yourself with lack. 
forget the lack and think only of abundance. Control your mental reactions so that automatically they become affirmative. This will be an interesting and happy experience. You are working in the laboratory of mind with the great law of your being. Abundance belongs to you. Good will come to you if you will affirm its presence. Learn to think abundantly. Think of the vastness of everything, the limitlessness of space, the numberless grains of sand on a beach. How abundant, how lavish nature is. Learn to see abundance in everything, to multiply the good you already possess. Be consciously one with the law of abundance. Expectancy will speed your progress. Silently say to yourself, I consciously identify with everything that belongs to goodness, truth, and beauty. I identify myself with abundance and success, with the living spirit, with all the power and all the presence and all the life there is. I lift my cup of acceptance knowing that the divine outpouring will fill it to the brim. And so now I invite you individually to think of that thing that you desire. Get an image of that in your mind's eye and say, I know the law of good is operating upon this desire. I know that I shall experience the good that I now affirm. I know that silently I am drawing into my experience today and every day an ever-increasing measure of truth and beauty, of goodness and harmony. Everything I do, say, and think is quickened by right action, into productive action, into increased action. My invisible good already exists. My faith, drawing on this invisible good, causes that which was unseen to become visible. All that there is is mine today, and all there ever was or can be is mine right now. And so include in your prayer family members and friends and loved ones. See them in your mind's eye. And remember that God, God's love, God's good is right where they are. Let your prayer be a blessing in the world so that the energy of your heart and consciousness emanates out from this sanctuary touching all people everywhere adding light and love and healing to the world. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God, and I'm certain that we are blessed by being together today. So with a full heart, I release this word. I know it's done, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.